Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Implementer's Guide to Deception Technologies, sponsored by Acalvio, Ativio, Ativo Networks, and Fidelis Cybersecurity. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Kyle Dickinson, SANS instructor and course author. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Kyle. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Carol mentioned, my name is Kyle Dickinson, and today I would like to talk to you about deception. At least that's what we're actually going to talk about. So you think I'll be trying to deceive you right now, but that's not the case. I'm going to be lighthearted and nice to you today. So today's agenda, let's go over the history of deception and talk about where um, we have seen some of the first use cases for uh, deception technologies, or as I call them, tricky threat detection capabilities. Uh, then we'll cover the benefits of deception technologies and how it can help our organization and security teams, how deception technologies can then also embed themselves to create some sort of attack prevention. We'll talk about implementing these technologies and certain use cases that are pretty common amongst a lot of organizations. And then last but not least, We'll cover the difference between open source tools as well as commercial solutions. So, little history lesson. Um, in the 1940s, the first United States Army group actually used deception to make the enemy believe that they were actually going to be invading a particular area during World War II by creating a fake army. They went as detailed as creating uh, decoy tanks, airplanes, ships, even creating fake documents, radio traffic, and even news broadcasts. Now, we're not necessarily going to be creating a fake militia, but we're going to look to see how we can use decoys throughout our environment to better enhance our security posture and threat detection and threat intelligence capabilities. And also, going back to even Greek mythology, the Trojan horse. Now, you may be familiar with the Trojan horse in the sense of it is malware that gets ran on a computer because it was disguised as something else. Well, this is where that term comes from. So, quick lesson on the Trojan horse. The Greeks constructed a giant wooden horse and hit a force of uh, troops inside. The Trojans pulled the horse into the gated city of Troy. And at night, the Greeks crept out and opened the forces or opened the gates to allow more forces in. Now, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a Trojan horse, when it comes to computer security terms, is someone potentially saying, hey, here's a zip file with a PDF or a report or even an Excel spreadsheet. It's executed and then uh, maybe a reverse shell or malicious software is installed. So you could see. Deception has been used throughout history. And even thinking about modern use cases too, outside of cybersecurity, if you've ever seen any movies that have a jet fighter scene in it and they're deploying the flares out the back to avoid the missile, well, those flares themselves are deception technology in that it's faking out the missile to think that that's actually the jet that it is you know, hitting. So if we think about that, we'll bring that back in a moment as to why that's relevant. So how can deception technologies work and how can they help us? Well, they can help reduce false positives uh, because what it's doing is it's alerting on interaction instead of pattern matching. We've all had the same song and dance where we've you know, responded to an alert after doing a quick investigation, we find out that it's actually nothing or it was a low impact. If any of you have ever had to administer an intrusion detection system or an antivirus system, you've probably had to create whitelists before because of these false positives. 
Another way that these deception technologies can help us is by creating more fruitful targets in that we can make it so there's a path of least resistance and then have the attacker believe they're actually on a production system. And then from there, since this decoy should not have production data on it, we can observe what the attacker is doing to gather better threat intelligence and understand their attack methods. So quick deception technologies 101. What kind of technologies are there that are at our disposal? What do we have in our toolkit? Well, there's token-based deception uh, using things such as bait files. And we'll cover how we can use bait files as a decoy. Uh, but for a quick example, a bait file could be, you know, quarterly earnings statement. And we're monitoring activity to that particular file. It could also be access keys to, say, a cloud service environment or private key to SSH the servers. It could also be certificates. So these are going to be token-based methods of uh, decoys for us to better understand the actions or activity once those tokens are consumed or discovered. Now, appliance-based deception, these are actually small appliances or they can be a server uh, to emulate various systems. These could be uh, smaller systems like a web server or a workstation to even maybe emulating a you know, small database server. And then you have, moving up the stack, enterprise level deception. That sounds pretty awesome to me. And it is awesome in the fact that it's a heavily way, it's a, a way to heavily integrate a deception technology or platform into our environment to where it's almost emulating our entire production environment. And we'll talk about a use case of how we can use this to our advantage. So how does deception technologies help us with our detection and response? Well, if we think about detection and going back to false positives, because these detections are based off of someone's actually interacting with the thing and the thing being the decoy, we know that these are our tripwires that we have throughout our environment. So no one should be touching those that have a legitimate use case. We can create target-rich decoys, such as uh, vulnerable applications that are intentional. We'll cover that in a moment. And what about our response? So with our responses, we have the opportunity to observe what the attacker is doing. Now, I understand that incident response plans may differ based on your organization or the industry that you're in. However, more times than not, if we have an attacker on the network with hands on keyboard, we probably want to boot them out of our environment as soon as possible. We'll talk about how that can kind of help but hurt us at the same time. But because they're potentially attacking a decoy, we get to watch them. We get to observe their techniques and better understand what was their entry method and what is it that they're actually trying to do with our environment. Do we notice that it is a tactical attack within our infrastructure? Or are they running a bunch of scripts that they found on a code repository? Or are they hitting Hail Mary on an exploitation framework? Now, how can these decoys or tricky threat detection capabilities uh, help with attack prevention? Well, we can have a what they call decoy to production system ratio that increases the attack surface as a benefit. So if we look back, if we deployed one decoy for every 100 production systems, that's almost hoping that the attacker finds the needle in the haystack. However, if we do a one decoy to every 10 production systems, or however the ratio could increase for our benefit, you could see that we're almost adding some fluff around our environment uh, to protect us from an attack. 
than any lation of the crown jewels being you know highly sought after systems and we'll talk about active directory in a moment but say we are a financial institution and we emulate that a database server is easily exposed and attacked that might be a fruitful target or say we have a lot of intellectual property in our environment and the attacker knows this they might be looking for say mailboxes or credentials to an executive and we'll see where we can apply these decoys at almost a defense and depth strategy uh, to better encapsulate our environment. So knowing the enemy beyond the hacker in the hoodie approach. So I mentioned most incident response plans may be that uh, we get the attacker out of our environment as soon as possible to limit the blast radius. Well, it's kind of like swatting at a mosquito. And we think about that as, you know, if you swat a mosquito that's biting you, we deleted it from existence. But if we boot out an attacker, a couple of things that come to mind if I'm thinking of my offensive security mindset is, okay, what was I doing that they were able to detect me and then booted me out of their environment? And also, what is in their environment that is valuable enough that they would want to actively kick me out as soon as possible? So because of the attacker mindset, we're able to modify how we go ahead and try to attack this infrastructure again or this organization. So we're almost molding our attacks to deceive the detection abilities as well. So it's not only organizations that could use deceptive technologies as a defense, attackers use deceptive technologies as an offense as well. So it helps us understand what the attacker is doing to deceive our detections. And that's why this isn't a replace of all your detection strategy. They're there to complement each other. So network assets, we're going to cover the different types of targets that we will have in our organization. So network assets are very common. We have routers, we have switches. Uh, we have things on the network. That is how we get data from point A to point B. We're not running around with flash drives anymore and handing off a document to be printed. At least I would hope not. And so an attacker can learn the landscape by doing things such as ping sweeps, port scans, and even vulnerability scans. Now, although these are kind of noisy types of ways to interrogate the environment, they are successful methods. And we can argue that it's because we're either not evaluating or not alerting on these types of activities because we probably have some sort of tool that's doing network monitoring and it does some sort of scan across our network and we got tired of seeing that alert over and over. Or we might have not run across a use case to where a detection is built around these types of ways to learn a landscape. And then from there, an attacker is able to fingerprint a host or an appliance to understand what is the make, the model, the OS, you know, if you've ever used Nmap before, you understand the power behind it to where we can identify just by having network connectivity to a device without having to authenticate to it, what kind of information we can pull to better understand what it is we're looking at. Active Directory. Now, I understand not everyone may be using Active Directory, but I would say the majority are. And Active Directory, if you're not familiar with it, contains users, computers, groups. It's how we get authenticated and authorized to our environment. And moving this even further, a lot of organizations start adopting uh, cloud-based Active Directory, such as Azure AD. So if an attacker is able to interrogate Active Directory, uh, they can get an idea of who are the local admins, uh, what's the global group, construct look like if they were to attack a 
user's credentials that might be in accounting, do they have the ability to somehow pivot through global group and permission inheritance to access maybe the database of a financial database server? Also stealing passwords from memory, uh, pretty common using tools such as Mimikatz. So why would a attacker want to get a, uh, you know, someone's account or credentials? Well, because our detections are gonna see an attacker trying to attack our infrastructure. But if we logged in as say, Mark the intern, we're gonna see actions and activity attributed to Mark the intern, not Kyle the attacker. This also gives us the ability to understand what kind of access this user has. And if this user has the access that we need, well then our attacks are successful. We can get the crown jewels as we want to grab. Now, different types of credentials that can be exposed very easily and is very common at this point in time are passwords being co uh, committed to code repositories. Now that doesn't necessarily require an attacker to be on our network, assuming that we're not using a self-hosted code repository, but open source intelligence allows them to look at the internet. Did they find a username and password for Mark the intern for code that he committed? Does he have a username and password written down on a piece of paper at his desk? Now we're starting to cover insider threats because insider threats are still a threat and decoys can also help us detect insider threat as well. So phishing, if we were to ask a group of security professionals, what's a more effective attack vector for an attacker? Dropping a zero day on an organization or sending a bunch of emails out to a bunch of say individuals that they pulled their email addresses off of say a website like LinkedIn. Most of us are gonna say a phishing attack. So we have the targeted phishing campaigns. It's called spear phishing. A very, very effective phishing campaign were credential harvesters. And back in 2019, I'm saying back in 2019, like it was a decade ago, but last year, Office 365 was spoofed with credential harvesters and it was getting a lot of users. And so what was happening was these attackers were using a credential harvester saying you need to log in. And when you did an unsuccessful login or a successful login, it captured those credentials and then forwarded you on to Office 365's landing page. So it would show that, you know, oh, you might have, you know, mistyped your password. Attackers also understand spam filters. There's actually marketing companies that can use technologies to circumvent spam filters and attackers understand those methodologies as well. Now, if we were also to look at metrics of how many times our organization has been susceptible to a phishing attack to how many times a user has reported it, it, it may be that it's reported all the time, which is great. Your security awareness program is two thumbs up in my opinion. But if we had mailboxes that were able to monitor to understand what type of phishing attacks are being received in our environment, instead of only relying on users reporting these types of phishy emails, that could better enhance our security posture so we can predict these types of attacks ahead of time. So covering the different use cases we just had, when we go to implement these uh, decoys or tricky threat detection capabilities, as I'll call them, uh, we also have to think about the business decisions. Uh, what is the effectiveness of our current security controls and processes? Do we have an efficient incident response plan? Do we have the proper detections in the proper areas? Do we understand what is considered sensitive within our environment. Because if we don't, and we say protect all the things, one, that can be rather costly, 
And two, it doesn't give us the time required to pay attention to what we would consider highly valuable in our environment. And also, what are the desired outcomes? Now, desired outcomes should be something that we can measure to determine are these decoys or this infrastructure performing what we need it to do to better our overall threat intelligence, threat detection, and understanding of the types of attacks to our environment, and what solutions will work best. If your primary concern is phishing attempts, do we necessarily want to deploy a bunch of decoys that emulate web servers? So understanding what solutions will work best will allow us to focus on that particular area. And this is why it's important to kind of break through that. Well, everything's important in our environment, so protect it all. And then last but not least, and we'll cover the difference between commercial and open source tools, but do we wanna build something or do we wanna buy something? And we'll, we'll evaluate the pros and cons momentarily. So bait files. Uh, bait files are, you know, files that we could deploy out into our environment where we are monitoring them because is it practical for us to, again, monitor every single file in our environment? Some environments have petabytes of data. That would be one heck of a monitoring strategy to even just monitor that many files or that big of a data set. So leveraging these bait files can help us, say, on a faux mapped network drive or files that might be appetizing to an attacker or insider threat such as employee salaries and so how can these help well if we think about how ransomware would work if you have the map network drive guess what ransomware is going to encrypt the files that are on that map network drive as well now if we have a ratio to where we have a lot of faux files and we're monitoring them, we have a better understanding of if we see a file getting encrypted or a bulk amount of files being encrypted, there's a likelihood that we have a ransomware attack in, inside of our environment. Because most times, at least throughout my experience, we're alerted of a ransomware attack when a user says, hey, I need about a thousand Bitcoin. And it's like, well, for what? Well, I have this, Thing saying that some agency is going to come after me if I don't pay a thousand Bitcoin. That's not really going to work for a lot of scenarios. And then covering insider threats, if we make faux documents such as, you know, uh, monthly earning statement or employee salaries or maybe even pay raise schedule and place them in an area where, you know, prying eyes shouldn't be, we understand that there's prying eyes. Now, honeypots. This is the first time that we've talked about honeypots. However, honeypots have been around for a very, very long time. And I would say that honeypots can be very valuable when we want to emulate some sort of service and what's great about honeypots is that we have different ways we can create a honeypot from low interaction all the way up to high interaction. And this can help us scale the type of environment that an attacker would come across and can help us scope down the administrative overhead um, for these types of honeypots as well. So low interaction being I am a little VM short and stout, and I respond to a ping request or I show that I have port 22 SSH or port 3389, which is remote desktop uh, available. And I'm not really hosting anything beyond that. I'm just responding to those types of requests. Then we could take it further where you may have heard of a honeypot and maybe even seen videos of attackers interacting with say something like an Apache web server. So they're in these quote unquote web server. They're trying to perform their attacks. They're trying to download their exploits or their other tool sets. 
And sometimes honeypots control the attacker as well and make it an unsuccessful attack. But we want to be cautious of how realistic is this decoy? Because realism and creativity will take a part into how successful your decoys will be. So if an attacker is able to detect your deception, well, then we might not be able to get the full picture of how they are trying to attack our network or be able to augment our threat intelligence. And then we have high interaction. This can be a full active directory domain. This can be a full three-tier application that gets deployed to your environment that has a you know, web server at the front, an application server in the back, and a database server all the way at the end. So we can get very creative in the scenarios that we set up based on the use case and requirements that you have so we can better understand these attackers. So I mentioned Active Directory could be considered a crown jewel or a desired target. Deploying a faux Active Directory environment can actually mimic our production Active Directory environment, but then fill it with you know, random users, maybe our favorite superheroes, and then our favorite superhero groups and have fake servers and domains and you know even list groupology objects if we want. So it helps our attacker go down in that rabbit hole even further, thinking that, oh, they found the crown jewels, they're mapping out the right environment to better you know, attack us. And that's not the case. And here we are able to evaluate their steps understand what it is they were looking for. You know, if they're looking and listing every single directory, they might be using a script to just dump our entire forest out. Or if they're looking in particular OUs, say for system administrators or executives or intern directory, you know, we could better understand the scope of their attack. Um, so we can either create additional detections in our production environment. And when we come to a faux Active Directory environment, comes faux credentials and faux accounts. Now, going back to the decoys of, if we deploy one decoy for every thousand users, that's again, the needle in the haystack scenario, where if we create users that are easy to, we'll say, quote unquote, crack and discover. And then they begin trying to use those credentials as a authenticated user in our decoy environment. What do they want to do as a authenticated user? Do they want to try to pivot, act as another user, try to find local administrators on a workstation? What is it that they want to do? And that can vary. But very common ways we can set up these decoys are usernames and passwords, password files, maybe even a password manager vault of some sort, or even a Excel spreadsheet that is labeled password list. We could also place access keys in plain text our environment. And actually a lot of these access keys may be stored in plain text already. And so setting those up in a environment can also give us an idea of, okay, they're trying to access our workstations to see if we have access to a cloud service provider. If they do see that, they're gonna to try to pivot to our cloud service environment. Going back to phishing decoys. So if we were to set up a fake mailbox in what we would call sensitive distribution lists, we could see the types of phishing attacks that might be hitting a distribution list that is set to receive from external email addresses. Or we can even create, say, decoy social media profiles. Now that could be a sensitive subject. Or just putting email addresses out there with our domain attached to it if an attacker is doing some sort of 
open source intelligence and trying to gather information about our environment or look for an easy attack vector, this could be a way with a fake mailbox. So we come down to, do we wanna build or do we wanna buy? Now there's plenty of great open source projects out there that cover you know, key management and dispersal from honeypots to, you know, open source threat intel feeds as well. And the advantages and disadvantages are a business decision that you'll have to make. A couple of advantages that I would call out, you're able to deploy uh, rapidly. Um, however, what you will need to understand also is do you have the skill sets within your organization to be able to deploy this type of infrastructure? Understand that we will have no service level agreements if our deception technologies were to break. Fortunately, we have communities. However, if we have our you know, high fidelity threat detection capability that is down, did we make an agreement with the organization that we will have it back up and running in an hour? And if we can't meet that, what does that mean for us? The advantage of having uh, flexibility and customization so we can mold the open source tool into our environment and configure it the way we want it is also very wonderful. And of course, above all else, lower startup costs. Now, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You will need to have hardware or infrastructure to deploy this tool set onto. So we won't say it's absolutely free, but you'll have lower startup costs. One risk I would recommend reviewing when determining do you want to build or do you want to buy is what happens if that open source project uh, just becomes discontinued. Uh, it doesn't get contributed to anymore because you know the, the primary developer got hired by some company or they just don't have the time because maintaining open source projects and respect to those that do maintain and contribute to open source projects is very time consuming. And if you want to then go from a open source project to a commercial solution, there might be some barriers to adoption. And then commercial tools. So commercial tools, um, you know, they're, they're great. It all depends on your use case and requirements. Uh, what I would say that I like about commercial tools is that they have SLAs. So if, you know, I'm on vacation and something starts to go awry, someone else can reach out to their support instead of relying on, say, my tacit knowledge to aid in resolving the problem while I'm you know, on the beach with a pina colada. A lot of these commercial tools will have built-in third-party integrations as well. So that accelerates our adoption to deception uh, technologies and also integrates with a lot of our potentially pre-existing commercial tools that we may be leveraging. Uh, some of them may also have some sort of hosted environment to where they are responsible for the administration of the underlying platform. And then you're responsible for maybe setting up a Amazon machine image or machine image through a cloud provider or standing up a agent throughout your environment. So it kind of offsets who's responsible administratively as well. And so those are very common solutions and very popular solutions that organizations are looking to adopt. So what I want you all to take away from this is deception is not a, a naughty word anymore when it comes to looking how an attacker is trying to get into our environment and building better threat intelligence for our organization to reduce the amount of risk that we have. Um, you know, deception, in my opinion, isn't a dirty word anymore. There are various decoys for the different use cases that we have and different crown jewels we may want to protect. And also going back to the whole 
decoy to production system ratio. Don't make it so the attacker has to find the needle in the haystack where you hope they come across the decoy. Look to have a happy medium when it comes to the amount of decoys you have distributed through your environment. With that, I'm sure some of y'all have questions. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to Carol and we'll go ahead and cover those questions that you'll have. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenter, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one asks, if cyber deception is so great, why isn't everyone doing it? If cyber deception is so great, why isn't everyone doing it? Um, honestly, some organizations may not have the uh, use case for it or they may not understand what deception technologies can do to enhance the security of their environment. Um, however, when we look at the history of honeypots uh, mimicking a web server, this has always been around, or maybe even some organizations are taboo about the word deception technologies. That's why I always, you know, lightheartedly say tricky threat detection methodology. All right, thank you. Our next question asks, this is just a discussion about honeypots, right? No, not at all. I, uh, I, I certainly hope that's not all you took away because we have capabilities such as honey tokens, the ability to stand up, you know, faux mailboxes to understand what type of phishing attacks are coming into our environment. Um, we have the ability to create honey tokens and mimic uh, access keys that we could monitor directly. Um, you know, maybe many years ago, uh, honeypots were the common and most spoken about methodology, uh, but it's certainly transforming to how we go about securing modern applications too, such as even uh, Docker containers and container orchestration platforms too. All right, thanks. Our next one says, this sounds great, but how do I convince my boss that it is it is a good approach? How do you convince a boss that it's a good approach? Well, I would see if there's some way you can collect metrics as to the common attack vectors for your environment and then show how many times that attack has been repeated over and over again or maybe even if there's been an attack that wasn't detected um, at all, or you know, just connecting them to the value and ways you can better supplement your threat detection or intrusion response. Being able to understand how attackers are attacking your organization specifically um, isn't something that uh, you know, we could find on the internet, unless if it's a news article. Uh, but connecting them to that value could certainly be helpful. All right, thank you. Do I need to have a robust security program to take advantage of deception? I would say if you have a mature security program or even a security program that's just getting off the ground, um, as long as you understand that this doesn't necessarily replace the maturity of your security models, but helps assist in the development of your security models um, should be something that should be clarified. All right, thank you. Deception seems focused on detecting attackers. Wouldn't we be better off allocating resources to methods to prevent the compromise in the first place? That could swing both ways. So we can say that yes, allocating more resources could solve the problem, but does that necessarily help us stop the bleeding? If we see that attackers are you know, hitting us through these different types of attack vectors and kill chains by you know, leveraging something like the MITRE attack framework, um, and we're able to put a stop um, to where it's being repeated, that helps because we want to analyze the root cause of the problem instead of just, you know, having a 
you know, quote unquote, cyber fire department just constantly having to put out the fires. All right, thank you. Do you have any recommendations of reading materials, books, articles, video-based courses that touches this topic in detail that I can consult to understand deception technologies? I can promise you that there's gonna be a white paper that's actually probably available out right now in the SANS reading room about deception technologies. All right, thanks. Uh, what are some of your favorite open source honeypots or frameworks for deceptive services? Some of my favorite honeypots. So in my, my position, I'll, I'll say that uh, I don't leverage honeypots too often um, as I, I focus on cloud security within my organization. And so honey tokens, I find a lot more value because of the current situations of credentials being discovered uh, within open source repositories or sorry, uh, code repositories for that matter, and also just understanding um, what an attacker wants to do with these types of uh, capabilities. So uh, for open source, there is a service, and I don't want to butcher the name. Um, I could tweet it out, but I believe it's called Honey Tokens. All right, thank you. Is deception meant to find advanced or basic attacks? all the above. And I would say that you will have a better understanding of basic attacks and advanced attacks, depending on the type of um, interaction of honeypots that you deploy, um, as well as the, I'd say, creativity of trying to make your decoys uh, not detectable by an attacker. Thanks, Kyle. Are you telling me that my investment in other detective technologies, such as IDS, DLP, and SIM were wasted and that I should replace them with deception? Not at all. No. So all of those plus decoys and deception technologies or tricky threat detection tools um, all supplement each other. Because if we think about an attacker and an intrusion detection system picks them up and then they're booted, well, then they could just change the way that their quote unquote mold is to the attack. But if we detect the pattern in which they're attacking us, we can add additional information to our detection systems, uh, our antivirus, our IPSs, uh, so on and so forth. You just move it up and down the stack. Um, so it helps in every facet of our network defense. All right, thank you. What if the attacker avoids my deception? That is why you don't throw out your IDS, IPS, and other detection capabilities. All right, thanks. I already spend a lot of time tweaking and tuning my IDS and SIM. I don't have the time to add another detective technology that requires similar tuning. Should I still be looking at deception? So time is a scarce resource for us all, um, but it shouldn't be one of the reasons why we don't want to enhance our detection capabilities. Um, you know, there's tools out there and that may be a, a good reason why you consider a commercial tool because if they're hosting the administrative platform and you may only have to say, um, manage a virtual machine appliance or an agent that gets installed on a server of some sort, uh, that reduces your administrative overhead. Um, but then also uh, augmenting those tools with some sort of uh, security orchestration and automation response. Uh, very popular topic now, also known as SOAR applications, um, are also increasing their efficiency with new detection methods too. All right, thanks. Are these deception technologies on a separate network, which is not in any way hooked up to the production network? Very well could be, um, depending on, you know, what it is your use case is and what your environment looks like. You know, if you have one flat network through your organization, because we got to assume all sizes of enterprises too, right? Um, you know, you may have your 
deceptive technologies, you know, just in a DMZ um, that's not connected through directly to your production environment. Or you may have, um, you know, a couple decoys in your production environment, uh, but implementing it in stages or layers uh, can help us um, see how far an attacker is getting. All right, thanks, Kyle. How scalable is deception? Can it be deployed in small environments and does it scale to the enterprise? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, you may have heard the term infrastructure as code uh, being used and it's especially popular with uh, DevOps teams nowadays. Uh, you can use infrastructure as code to scale the deployment of deception technologies um, again, or you can use uh, commercial tools to scale that with you. But really, uh, when we look at scaling, what are we wanting to grow? Because it's very easy to deploy, uh, you know, hundreds of you know, access keys throughout the environment, but it might be um, a little more time consuming to scale up, you know, a complex faux Active Directory infrastructure. So I would say it depends on the maturity of your scaling capabilities as they exist now because you're not going to automatically be able to scale um, to a wide variety if you don't have a method of managing that already. All right, thank you. Uh, what types of forensics and intel can be generated by deception that you don't typically get from other prevent or detect systems? So we can record the um, attacker's moves uh, we can look to see um, what it is that they're actually trying to accomplish. Uh, we could also understand what types of attacks are being utilized at a high level with our environment. Going back to the phishing mailbox uh, example, uh, we might not have insight to all of the um, successful phishing mail that is past our spam gateways. Um, so that gives us, that affords us an opportunity to evaluate that even further. Um, it also under, helps us understand what type of deceptive technologies an attacker is using themselves? Thank you. What are the top three benefits of cyber deception? I would say, and this is just from my, my point of view, um, the observability of the attacks, um, the ability to have our uh, opportunity to create higher fidelity alerts. And then also since it's um, not behavioral based, uh, but it's actually action based, you know, someone is touching a server, someone is touching a file, someone's using a password, instead of, oh, this matched a heuristic pattern, uh, trigger an alert. So that higher fidelity um, could be very valuable too. All right, thank you. Deception sounds great. But what if the attacker discovers its use? Does that eliminate its usefulness? I wouldn't say that it eliminates the usefulness, but could be an indicator of how we need to adjust our methodologies um, for these decoys. Uh, if we think about you know, our intrusion detection systems, uh, they're not a set it and forget it type technology. We want to maintain them, we want to keep them up to date, we want to uh, create um, signatures around them, very similar to our deception technologies or our decoys. If we think about, uh, you know, if we were to create an inflatable tank and put it in the parking lot and then just set it and forget it, uh, what if it deflates that is no longer a effective decoy? Um, we have to constantly fill it with air, make sure it's not fading, make sure it still looks like a tank instead of you know, turning into a beach ball of some sort. All right, thanks, Kyle. That's all the questions we have for today. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, you know, I would say that, uh, again, deception technologies uh, may have had a taboo around the word deception. Um, tricky, again, the uh, the heart, the lighthearted way of saying uh, deception is the you know tricky detection methods uh, however i do see that with modern technologies come modern problems and how do we 
better understand these types of attacks with that within our environment. You know, we may currently uh, subscribe to Thread Intel feeds, and those definitely great um, have their use cases. But how do we then supplement it with what is really relevant to our environment as well? And Kyle, I hope you don't mind. We had another question pop in. Sure. They ask, uh, will these deception technologies have a mechanism to block the attacker from covering their tracks? Because if they can, it means it will remove vital information that helps us to understand the tools and techniques they are using. So if you think about the attacker attacking our environment, they're in a glass box, and there's a bunch of, say, closed circuit television cameras all around them observing their attack. Um, unless I would say, if, unless if they're able to attack the deception platform itself, um, our, our logging is being ingested, our alerts are already being ingested. If they have access to be able to delete logs from our SIM and delete logs from our deception platforms, uh, then I would say that is problematic. Um, that's why we also want to secure the infrastructure that we use to create these decoys. All right, well, thank you so much, Kyle, for your great presentation. And to Acalvio, Ativo Networks, and Fidelis Cybersecurity for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thank you.